So we're into the second section of the course, which is broadly called operability. And I'd start the section off by giving you an overview of the reasons why we're looking at operability. And there were five reasons that basically drive the need for the fact that we see things like two pumps in parallel or bypasses around heat exchanges and so forth. And we're going to build on that. Dr. Mylan looked at reliability then for three lectures. It was intended to be two lectures, but then um, he offered to give yesterday's uh, Wednesday's class as well. So um, I'm now going to start a new topic on the section called flexibility. So think about this word for a minute. Talk with someone next to you. What does it mean if something is flexible? Something or someone is flexible. And think of the opposite. What if you call someone inflexible? Okay, so think of that concept and discuss it a bit. Okay, some ideas. What is that, that term? What sort of feelings? What does it mean to you? No comments? I know it's Friday, but this class is going to be very interactive. Nicole? Okay with change. Any other concepts? So operate at various conditions. And this applies to people too. So if we call someone flexible, they're op able to operate under various conditions. Okay, maybe they can operate in a noisy office, a quiet office, mills, third library, second floor, third floor. Some of them areas are noisier than others, so you're flexible with that, yeah? Different solutions to one problem. Different solutions to the same problem, okay? So in a chemical plant, we need to produce one product, but there might be a variety of ways we do that, so flexibility. Other suggestions? What, maybe what happens if you call someone inflexible? So one of your group members is inflexible. They're very rigid. There's only one way that, that things can be, right? Stubborn. Stubborn? Okay. That's maybe taking it to the next step. Yeah. So, <laughs> so if a process is rigid, let's think of this now. I'm going to start to introduce terms, and you'll see where this class is heading today. If, let's think of driving a car, okay? Driving a car is a really good way to visualize a plant. When we operate a plant, it's very similar to driving a car. There's two things that you change when you're driving a car. Suggestions? Speed and direction. Okay, how do you change, let me I'll rephrase it. How do you change, how do you steer your car? What things do you vary? You've got the wheel. Gas, right? So gas brake, the brake is opposite of gas, so if we consider that one concept. So two, two main things that you vary in a car. Same for a chemical plant. I'll, I'll show you the equivalence in a minute. So if we look at a car, we can consider flexibility as the ability to steer a process. Okay. And like a car, we've got our wheel, and that's a feed-forward device, right? So if you're driving, you're preemptively avoiding pedestrians, obstacles in the road, other vehicles on the road. Okay, so that's, the wheel is the equivalent of feed-forward. Gas, the gas pedal, is the equivalent of feedback. OK, 
Okay. The gas pedal is the equivalent of feedback in the sense that you have a desired set point in mind that you want to operate at, desired speed, and so you move your gas pedal to get to that set point. Now, if we had mentioned this idea of a rigid being the opposite of flexible. So if we think of that in the terms of a motor vehicle, without a wheel, so no flexibility, it's rigid, you can't move that wheel, you can only go in one direction. It's not a very flexible vehicle, only go one, di one way. Let me give you the wheel back, but now I take your gas and fix it at 50%, so midway. Okay, so you're driving along a flat road and you're going comfortably at that speed with that amount of gas. But what happens if you approach a hill going up? You're going to slow down. So the hill is the equivalent of a disturbance. You're going along, operating where you'd like to be, and now this disturbance comes along, which is the form of a hill going up. Your car, if you're not able to change that gas pedal level, you're going to slow down. Conversely, if the hill is downhill and your gas is at 50%, you're going to go fairly dramatically fast. Okay? So you're not able to deal with disturbances. So flexibility, rigidity, being rigid, the ability to change. Okay? With change, operate at various conditions. So the idea of flexibility for people and the concepts that you have in mind with that term apply equally well to a process. But in a process, we don't have a steering wheel. We don't have gas. But we need to do two things. Feed forward is like driving towards a set point. You want to drive according to a certain road trajectory. You need to turn left at the traffic light. That's a set point. You want to move yourself in that direction. You want to go at 120 kilometers an hour. That's a set point. Okay, you want to slow down to 100 kilometers an hour, that's a set point change. Okay? So we can achieve that in a vehicle with a wheel and gas. What's the equivalent in a chemical process? What's your gas? What's your wheel? What's your feed forward? What's your feedback? How do you actually implement a change in a process? Valves. Okay? Valves, sensors, control loops. Okay, so the topic of flexibility, i.e. making a process to be okay with change, being capable to operate at a variety of conditions and a variety of set points. So let's put, make this concrete. So operate in the face of disturbances, being able to operate with set point changes that your controllers make. Okay, those are characteristics of a flexible process. Let me draw another picture to you that will emphasize this concept in a way that we've seen before. So recall we were looking at a flash drum earlier, and we had this guy up on the board, and we called that flow, I believe was F1, if I remember correctly, and this was temperature. Okay, what did we call that? That's that region. Operating window, right? And you derived one for a different system in the last assignment. What does flexibility mean in this context? Niall? The area of the window. So here's your nominal base case operating point. That's where the plant is designed for. But being flexible means that you can move in this direction. So if the best economics currently are at that point, being able to steer your process, drive your process, well, what do we have to do to do that? We have to change two things. You have to increase flow from this much to that much, and you have to increase temperature from this point to that point. Okay? So two things you have to do simultaneously 
or in some way, it doesn't matter how you do it, you might either choose to increase temperature and then flow or change both simultaneously. The operator might flick both set points up and both control loops converge you to that new operating point. That's flexibility driving your process. Set point changes and control loops to do, to do that for us. And the equivalent of the gas pedal is your valve. Opening valves, closing your valves. Opening your valve to increase the flow, changing the valve position to affect the temperature. Okay, so this class, this topic is all about control loops. And I know you know this stuff because I taught it to many of you in 3P. Okay? And it's a prerequisite for 4N. It's, one of the mo it's probably the most important prerequisite for this course is understanding control theory and that processes move and change. So that's where we're going today. And I want you to maybe look at it a little bit more. I'm going to actually use an example that you should be familiar with. Let's take a look at, now this isn't going to come up clearly, but you're going to see what I'm referring to is your flow sheet that we're considering here. And I'm going to take just this section where you're taking air, compressing it, and putting it into a heat exchanger. So I'm going to look at flexibility just around that region. So what I'll do is just redraw it for you over here. So we've got air coming in into a compressor. We're taking it into a heat exchanger with high pressure steam. And then we have it leaving over there again. Okay, so we're very familiar with this step in the flow sheet. This is stream number two. This is stream number four. And this is stream number six. And if you look up the information for that, I'm going to write it here in red. This is at 25 degrees Celsius nominally. This is at 164 degrees. And this is at 240 degrees Celsius. Okay. So I'm going to look at steering your process just around this unit. And that's what's on the flow sheet, right? That's what Turton's textbook gives you. That's what the memo number one gives you. But that is not drivable. That is a rigid process. At the moment, you can only operate this process in one way. The air must come in at 25 degrees Celsius. It gets compressed to 164. And um, I'll put here the pressure 3.10 bar. It must be here at 240 degrees Celsius. And that's 144 tons per hour. That's rigid, right? That's the opposite of flexible. How are we going to add some flexibility to this process? Well, there's the answer up there that's going to guide us. To make a process flexible, it's got to be able to handle disturbances. So let's give the first disturbance. The first disturbance that we're going to consider is it's not summer. So the air coming in here is now minus 25. And when that happens, let's just assume for argument's sake that it's a 50 degree drop. We see the same corresponding drop out there on the compressor. So this is 114. But this air stream gets heated up by that heat exchanger and goes to a reactor. The reactor has to have the feed at 240 degrees Celsius. Okay, so we still have to reach that end point despite it being winter outside and our air now being a whole lot colder. What do we add to make this process flexible? Joseph? Okay, so a valve controlling the feed, the feed flow rate of the HPS, the high pressure steam, and where do you place your sensor? Stream six. So let's add that flexibility to the process now. Okay. Let's just call it TC. It's a temperature controller. And to add this flexibility, we're going to need a valve.
Okay, so you've just bought yourself a whole lot of flexibility there. Now the process is a whole lot less rigid. When it's cold coming in, this stream is 114. This temperature will sense that it's below set point and it will drive that valve position to be open. Do we care that the high pressure steam flow rate is higher than it was before from summer to winter? We only care for an economic reason. It's going to cost us more steam in winter. But we know that, and we build that in to the piping design, that the piping design here, so that when this valve is 100% open, we can still achieve 240 degrees Celsius here, even though it's winter with air coming in at minus 25. OK? So this is the thinking we go through to add flexibility. And we've added flexibility for one reason, for changes in the temperature. That's feedback. That's an example of feedback to adjust for a disturbance. Let me give you an example of feed forward to adjust for a set point change. The process needs to slow down. We're currently operating at 80,000 tons per year. Let's slow it down to 60,000 tons per year because there's less demand for our product. To do that, we're going to make a set point change. This is a preemptive change. This is feed forward. The forecasters, economic people in the company, feed forward saying to you, slow the process down. The economics are not favorable. We're preemptively making a change to the process. So we set new set point changes. Well, what do I add to this flow sheet in order to adjust for that? A valve at stream two. And do I need anything else? A set point. A set point for that flow controller. Okay, so flow control is now ne necessary here. So we can add it at stream two. We might choose to add it to this point over here. So we, we compress the air first and then f measure that compressed stream. Okay, so we need flow. And I need. Sorry, I need a valve, I need a sensor, and I need So there's my flow controller. I've drawn this the wrong way, right? So there's my uh, flow meter. I measure that, I control according to it, and then I need to add a, f a valve into the system. Okay, so at lower pressure? Well, but you still have your feedback, you would still have your flow control meter at stream uh, four, I believe. Okay, stream, yeah. But by feeding in more low pressure air or less or however much, you would still have the, the proper tuning to your controller to say, oh yeah, cut it by this small amount, and then it would make a bigger change. Okay. Right. So the way that these compressors typically are, they're just big vents that are open to the air and sucking in the air and then compressing it. Yeah. So it's, this is an open, open area that is very carefully fenced off to make sure you don't get birds and people sticking their hands in there and other sorts of interesting stuff. Okay. Dr. Marlin spoke about compressors and surge in, in Wednesday's class, right? And mentioned even fluid and vapor inside, um, sorry, droplets. Uh, will damage a compressor. So we spend a lot of money making sure what's coming into a compressor is um, only vapor phase. Why is the sensor downstream from the valve and not upstream from the valve? The answer is in the notes prior to the section. It's a topic I didn't teach, but I'm expecting you to read the PDF. The part I taught just prior to Dr. Marlin talks about that. Very important. We always place our sensor where the pressure is highest and the temperature is lowest. Okay, So put this where P is high and T is low. Okay, But there's a reason for it. It's related to Bernoulli. It's related to fluid flow. 
2.0 stuff. You're going to very quickly see in this course from now to the end of the year, I'm going to be pulling in topics from every single course that you've taken at Mac. Right? You don't, it's the wrong way to see your education is by courses. We're, it's a global view you need to have. Okay? So we're not, we didn't just learn 2.0 and then forget it. We didn't learn 3K or 3P. We were learning everything and bringing it together here. Niall? That's for, uh, for, any, for any way of throttling this because it goes through a constriction and then it expands again, right? So you get pressure losses there. So we want to minimize that. So we put it where pressure is highest and temperature is lowest to prevent cavitation and other problems. Okay, so two, two things that are not on Turton's flow sheet, the flow sheet I gave you, that you need to add to get <coughs> flexibility. After the valve. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> okay, so you're going to see the general rule for flexibility is add valves, add sensors, add control loops. There's a fourth item we're going to add, and you'll see that in another example coming up, is bypasses. Okay, so flexibility then is achieved. You might want to just note that. achieved by valves, sensors, and control loops. Okay. So as I said in the tutorial this week, you're going to go home over the next few days and ensure that your group starts to add these feedback control loops, sensors in at places that it makes sense. Let's take a look at a different example. Um, Maybe just one other thing to point out here is that every, every control loop, you, we know this from 3P, every control loop needs some final control element, something to manipulate. So every control loop that we have, we have two control loops. The minimum number of valves we need is two valves. Right? It's like a car. If you want to adjust the speed, you have one tool to do that, the gas pedal. Every control loop needs a valve. So the minimum number of valves corresponds to the number of control loops. Any questions on that so far? Okay, let's take a look at a, at a different example then. Um, I'm going to look at a, a bioreactor example. We do a lot of petroleum stuff in this course or petrochemical, typical petrochemical flow sheets, but let's take a look at a bioreactor. And those of you that are not in bio, don't switch off just yet. I'm going to use this example because it's batch related. We don't do a lot of batch processes either, but I know you know batch processes because I taught that one as well, <laughs> um, thanks to my department chair. So the <laughs> classic example of a batch system is a closed tank with agitation in it. And in the bioreactor, it's batch based, so we we feed our substrate, our raw materials. At the end of the batch, we pump it out. And during the batch, we change the temperatures of the reactor. And we also have to add air. So bioreactors um, often need air. So we sparge air into the reactor to provide the, nutrient, uh, the nutrients, the air that they need. Let's just take a look at, at one particular variable. Let's take a look at the temperature, for example. And in this particular batch, the nominal trajectory, so we've heard this term in, in 3K, the nominal trajectory for temperature might have been decided from the scientists that developed this batch process that temperature needs to ramp up to some peak and then fall back down again. Okay, so that's the, the batch duration might be a certain time frame, a couple of hours, 
So the first hour it ramps up linearly, and the last hour it ramps down in an exponential decline. Your operating window for the batch might look something like this. This is where this starts to change. In continuous processes, there's no idea of time. Time goes away. But in a batch process, time is the essence of a whole batch process. It's the distinguishing feature of batch systems. Right? So your operating window in a batch process will be time-based. And it might be that the operating window is something like this, that you're able to operate in a region of ramps up, and then in a region of ramps down. So for example, this batch might need to go this way, but another batch coming later on, a few days might peak at this point and exponentially decline. Another batch might come up here, fall back that way. You have a region of batch trajectories, that's your operating window, is now trajectory based. As drawn here, this system will not be able to achieve that trajectory over time. What flexibility do I need to add to achieve that desired temperature change and temperature trajectory? What's missing from my flow sheet? How do I add flexibility to it? Clear? Okay, so I'm missing a temperature sensor. So let's add that in over there. And it's going to manipulate. Okay, so this might be an electrical heater. What if this is just steam? Okay, the flow rate of the steam. That will heat me up. Now what do I do at this point? I need to cool it down, so I need coolant. Okay, so what we'll typically do is we'll have a valve here for steam and a valve for cooling water going in. Okay, so you'll, you'll close one and open the other. Okay, so to get your flexibility in this process, then the temperature controller will then, and I'm running out of space here, but will control these two valves and open them appropriately when required. Okay, so one variable, temperature, we need a sensor, a control loop, and one or more valves. The minimum number of valves is one. The rule is you only need one valve for each control loop, but that's a minimum requirement. In certain cases, you may need more valves. In this instance, we need two valves in order to successfully move temperature. There will be inevitably a cascade loop embedded in that to ensure that this is tracked. Remember, we, uh, we learned about cascade in 3P. But I'm just drawing the global outer loop. Yeah. Yeah. OK. That's temperature. What about controlling dissolved oxygen? So now there's the need to control that trajectory. Another loop there. Okay, so we measure the oxygen level in the tank using a dissolved oxygen sensor and manipulate the valve flow rate for the air. If you need to vary pH, so bioreactors are very uh, sensitive to the pH of the environment that they're in, we'll have a valve for our acid or our base with the pH sensor. Okay. If you need to vary the flow rate of the substrate coming in, might be a semi-batch reactor where you feed the substrate in on a, in a certain way. So you might, uh, the substrate feed might need to be at one flow rate and then ramp up to a higher flow rate and then close, close the substrate later on. So this is the stuff that bioengineers plan and work out what these trajectories look like. But once that trajectory comes from the bio, 
people, we need to implement it as set point changes. And so we need a valve for the substrate flow. So every degree of flexibility, we need a control loop for it. Okay, is that starting to become clear now, what flexibility is about? Okay, let's take a look at um, some other ideas related to process control and flexibility that are important that uh, you might have forgotten since 3P. And I'll give you an example and uh, give you a chance to work on this. So I'd like you to add flexibility to this system where it's a continuous process. Okay. And it's your classical CSTR that you've seen too many times. So first order reaction, say, liquid phase, continual feed in, continual feed out, and it requires a bit of heat to get it going, okay? So I'd like you to add the control loops on that system for the flexibility required to control the following. I'd like you to be able to control level. I'd like you to be able to control flow. and temperature. Okay, so add the necessary flexibility around those three systems quickly. Uh, in or out, it doesn't matter for CSTR. So feel free to talk with other people as well on your decisions that you're making. I'm just going to draw it a little bit lower so I have space to add stuff. So what's the minimum number of valves we need? Two valves? Three? Anyone? Two, TR? You think you can get away with two? Okay. Anyone want to suggest the two valve case? No. Okay, let's, let's just keep it simple. Three valves, three control loops. We're going to start with three control loops, one for level, flow, and temperature. So let's start with um, flow. How are we going to control flow? Add the necessary flexibility to get flow. Suggestions, Niall? Okay, a flow sensor for the top feed going in. Uh, 
Okay. Yeah. Wouldn't you want it downstream? Uh, it does. Does it matter? <laughs> no. It's always an interesting one, yeah. It, and it, it does throw people initially, right? It doesn't really matter which side of the valve it is. If you're pumping liquid, it's measuring the flow, it's going to open and close the valve. There's steady state across that pipe and the flow measured before the valve is the same as the flow after the valve, okay? Yeah. A meter, okay. <laughs> I'll add a meter. It depends on the technology, right? Yeah, so it, yeah, we'll typically put, as I said, where that's the highest pressure and the lowest temperature. We'll choose to put that. Okay, so there's my flow. I'm controlling flow at that point. Um, let's come back to the question, what if I chose to control flow downstream? Joseph? Uh, can you only do that, or you can only use that if you control the level, right? Because if you, if the, the flow rate will depend on the level of the pressure and all that. Okay. Okay, so the, there's the question of uh, this idea of controlling level, right? We need to control level as well. I'll come back to that follow up. How are we going to control level? Where do we need to put my sensor? Where am I going to put my valve? These are decisions we take as engineers. This is not other people's jobs, so we need to be able to figure this out. Jairus? So connect my level, a level sensor here, and connect it up to this valve. What are the concerns with doing that? Okay, but we do need to control the flow coming in. Right, so this is why this, that I've chosen this problem because now it's not obvious necessarily how we pick to pair our variables. So this is the loop pairing problem. Uh, we have to pick how we're going to control flow. I could control flow over there, but then I, I, sorry, I can control level over there, but then I can't control my inlet flow because that, that valve is then already committed to, to level. Okay, so suggestions on how to, to go from this point. Joseph? Okay, so put a valve over here to control level there. Okay. Michelle? So if you're controlling the flow and you're controlling the level and they don't agree, <laughs> you're going to not be able to control. Okay, so what does it mean if control loops don't agree? using that terminology. <laughs> they fight, okay? And we do use this terminology in control theory. We say that the loops fight, or more correctly, they interact. Okay, so we heard that term in 3P. And we used a relative gain array, RGA, to figure that out, okay? So if control loops are independent of each other, it means that they have no disagreement. <laughs> they don't fight with each other. They can operate independently of each other, okay? So absolutely, in this case, we would need the capacity to ensure that provided over the range of flows that we see over here at the inlet, that the level is able to be controlled. That these pipes and pumps are sized appropriately so that we can maintain the level at the desired location. Okay, well, it's the, you'd have the same net effect to use a variable flow on the pump. Would there be, like, a benefit to doing one or the other? Or? It, it, again, it, it might be in a, um, if this is a bio system, you may not like the idea of um, certain valves and pumps are harder to clean, and so you might move to a different technology. So it would be very case-specific. The principle here is that we're able to throttle and vary the flow, whether it's the valve doing it as your final control element or you using your pump as a final control element to do so. 
The last variable there, temperature, we haven't addressed yet. Do any of these two variables affect temperature? If I adjust the flow, will it affect temperature? If I adjust the level, will it affect temperature? Before you shake your head, no, think carefully. <laughs> okay. There's a reaction occurring in the tank. Right, so less flow coming in is less of material A, and if this was the, a, the classical A goes to B and your concentration, of, you're feeding less flow of A in, there's less material to react, there's less heat required, the temperature is going to change. Okay, so there will be interaction this way. But how are we going to control temperature in this example? How are we going to, what are we going to pair? What's our loop pairing? This one's an easier one. No suggestions for temperature. Yeah, Nicole? Okay, so I have a temperature sensor over here and then adjust that flow rate of the heating medium. Okay. So Three control loops, three valves at a minimum have been added. Okay, and there is the potential for interaction. But one of the things that you're starting to see here is the choice of, of variables. I, we know that temperature is affected by the flow, but why would I not control temperature with this flow rate coming in? Why doesn't it make sense to us? It's very indirect. That flow coming in is set by our production requirements firstly, okay? And here's a key rule of thumb. We don't put control loops in the direct line through our process because if we need to produce 80,000 tons per year of product, the last thing we want to do is have a temperature control loop shut this valve for us and then we end up producing less or more than what we need. So in the main flow, the path of our materials, we don't put control loops that are ancillary to what we want, right? You obviously put flow control loops in that path because you want to be able to manipulate that flow, but you don't go control temperature using that valve, even though temperature is affected by that valve position. The other reason why this is not a suitable choice is dynamics. This is why 3P4 is so important. Two things kill any control system. And they're similar to each other. Well, one is time delay, right? And the other is slow dynamics. Very same, similar idea. Slow dynamics to the extreme is the same as time delay. But this is the example I, I gave to you guys in 3P. It's like driving your car, but you're seeing what's in front of you on a five second delay, right? So imagine that you're driving your bike or your car and you're, what you're seeing right now is what happened five seconds ago. What do you think is going to happen? It's a five second time delay. You've got a five second latency with when your brain sees the image. You're going to be causing some serious accidents, right? Okay, so in a control loop, it's no different. The control loops, the thing that will absolutely kill any control loop is the time delay. If you think about it in this way, imagine we're measuring the temperature over here, and for some reason there's a delay in the computer system that reads the temperature and reports it to the controller. For whatever reason that is, it might be the technology of the probe that you're using doesn't react fast enough, but let's say there's a five second delay here. The control valve is going to, if the temperature in here is too low, the control valve is going to open. And we're going to start adding heat. We start adding heat, this is warming up. But this sensor still sees that the temperature stayed what it was. So it opens the valve a bit more. And then still nothing is recognized one second later, two seconds later, three seconds later. We have to wait five whole seconds before we start to even record a change. So what happens in time delay and slow dynamics is we overcompensate. Right? You go too, too much. You open that valve too much. And now you've poured all the steam and heat into this coil 
Now your temperature has risen too high. Eventually your sensor, five seconds later, sees that the temperature in here is too high and it says, okay, now I need to back off. So it starts to close the valve and then it sees nothing happening. So you close the valve some more and then still nothing happens because of this delay. Right, so you're going to be doing this and this and this and this. And you damage your equipment by opening and closing valves so frequently. And you're going to damage whatever you're trying to react in here is going to be creating a product that is pretty much garbage because you now over-converted and under-converted, over-converted, under-converted um, all your quality properties in that tank um, will be all over the place. Okay, so time delays and slow dynamics will kill any control system. So bearing that in mind, does this loop pairing make sense? Let's come back to the idea of controlling temperature with this variable. What is the time delay and dynamics on using this valve versus using this valve for temperature control? How, do, how are the dynamics different for changing temperature in the tank using valve V1 versus using valve V3? So we remember when we did this in process control, we'll derive the ODEs. We'll look at the time delays. Joseph? So you're asking like which one would be better? Yeah. So, well, V3 would, would work better because it's uh, you know, pumping heat into the system rather than just dampening the effect of heat by adding more material. Right. If we had adjusted V1 in order to control temperature, you have to f slow down your flow so now you're putting less material into the tank and then eventually there'll be less heat requirements and it will adjust the heat in the system. But it's not an effective or as effective as using temperature through this valve V3. And your, your range over which you can control is far greater with this variable over here. Right? So, so there's many good reasons why this is a better loop pairing than the other one that we might have proposed. So we, we, cho we choose our loop pairing for fast dynamics and for no time delay or for minimal time delay. Okay, so there's that question in the tutorial this week about that on the distillation column. There were the four loops and why they paired that way. And that's the thinking we're, we're having behind that. Okay, so, so I want you to bear that in mind. Now, I'm going to leave you with one problem to think about, loop pairing. And this one is another one that you've actually looked at already. But consider this case. You've got two streams meeting. I think that was called F5. That was called F6. And how are you going to pair your loops? And how are you going to control? And where are you going to put your valves? If you want to control F7 and the composition. So you've got two objectives, control composition and control the flow. Because remember, in the flow sheet, what happens after this is it goes to the reactor. And the fluidized bed needs it at a certain flow rate, and it needs it at a certain composition. Okay, so both of those are control objectives. Where are you going to add your valves? And which valves are you going to pair with F7 and A7? Okay, so think about that and then we'll take that up on Monday's class.